So Stephen's um, invitation was, I think, a little bit of a provocation in some ways, uh, in the sense that uh, a conversation that's really about um, archiving and collections and display is quite interesting because we have uh, no display space, we have no collection, and we have no archive. And actually, um, uh, this is perhaps an interesting kind of framing of, of conversation about where, where we're from in terms of a deep history prior to the invention of the project that is Lux Scotland um, and where we would like to be, uh, which, and I think that this is quite a kind of interstitial moment. Uh, so Lux Scotland is nearly two years old, it'll be two years old in April, um, and uh, was uh, formed out of a variety of needs, but generally it was a kind of uh, conversation that I had uh, I guess about six years ago with the director of uh, Lux in London, uh, Benjamin Cook, um, about forming an outpost of some sorts of Lux. Um, there were uh, not quite the pressures uh, that arrived with Lux Scotland. Lux Scotland appeared just shortly after the Scottish independence referendum, um, which is key uh, also to its formation. Um, but there were a number of concerns about uh, what Lux had been doing we had uh, been focusing on a lot of kind of skills provision, uh, learning projects, education projects, and one of those was um, the Associated Artist Program, which uh, was run by um, Ian White and uh, served eight artists over a period of two years. Uh, the second year was so that they could create their project, but actually what was happening was the AAP meetings were all based in London, and we were finding that a lot of younger uh, really exciting artists uh, in Scotland were moving to London and not coming back. Um, and so this kind of general conversation about brain drain, I suppose, uh, it's a terrible phrase, but it was a real kind of fear that we were actually just losing talent and skills and um, uh, potential skills provision to London and that we really needed to address this in some way. Um, I was in New York at the time uh, working on other projects there, so it just didn't quite come into fruition until I came back. Um, but what we are, instead of, I guess, talking about what we are not or what aren't yet, um, is a distributor um, in the broadest uh, sense of the word. Um, um, <clears throat> and, um, but we're also interested in the distribution of knowledge about moving image. The tagline for Lux Scotland is that we're a support and uh, support and promotion agency for artists working with moving image. Um, but I think that uh, distribution can be uh, an interesting uh, framing word in terms of, uh, I guess, resolving some of the differences between um, a more market-driven or commercially-driven uh, interests, like basically trying to get works by artists into institutions or into private collections or into foundations. Um, but also just simply showing that work, making sure that it circulates. Um, and along with uh, that goes the distribution um, of a certain set of questions that are really kind of key to Lux Scotland. Uh, first and foremost is what does Scottish artist moving image look like? Um, and what does a Scottish history of artist moving image look like? And these are, these are uh, questions that haven't really been posed so much, Scotland's a very small country, uh, but it does have a rich history. Um, and I think that by answering some of these two questions, we can come on to the third question is, um, you know, why, why should anybody in Scotland be interested in, uh, in moving image, artists moving image at all? Um, in relation to the distribution of knowledge, there's also the question of what do artists uh, uh, from, from Scotland need? Uh, that is maybe different from elsewhere? Uh, what are the pressures that are different from those uh, that are artists facing in London, per se? Um, and who has the skills to engage this work, uh, these questions, and how do we connect with them? So distribution is actually kind of all we do, and distribution puts these uh, questions into circulation. I'm really aware that we're not necessarily in a place to answer all these questions, so a lot of our work is collaborative. As I said before, we don't have a space, we have an office. Um, and so any of our public outputs are necessarily collaborative 
either with a gallery or an institution, uh, with um, you know a group that might not have a space itself, in which case we find kind of pop-up spaces or we inhabit other institutions. We're really interested. Uh, you could say it's a parasitic model, and that's fine. Um, uh, or you could say that we're uh, interested in inhabiting other people's uh, structures. Um, I'm really aware that this is um, not kind of coming out of the blue uh, in terms of uh, thinking about distribution. You might recognise some of these logos. These are distributors, um, interestingly, that kind of come out less of a national or a location context, but much more uh, to do with medium and genre. Um, so Electronic Arts Intimix is like fabulous, uh, super professional organisation uh, operating out of uh, New York is really invested in um, uh, the kind of the, the uh, early video artists and pioneers that uh, came out of the Castelli Sonnebent collection in the 70s and 80s and continues to work very, very interesting artists now like um, Stanya Khan. Video Data Bank, uh, obviously working with video um, in Chicago. Uh, Lightcone, which is more invested in experimental uh, film, I would say, uh, operating out of France, and then of course Lux uh, in London. And so Lux Scotland just literally is a tiny little little uh, little dot in the sky in, in, in relation to the activities of Lux, but they're quite important in terms of uh, when Lux started it was just me working two days a week. <laughs> Uh, it was just, I guess, you know, again, to go back to this word project, the, the, the Lux Scotland project, it was to kind of assess need in the first instance. Um, uh, but yeah, so these, these, these are all different models, and I'm really aware that we kind of come from a national model. Um, but I guess to describe uh, a little bit actually where we're really from, um, although this is the context that we currently inhabit, you kind of actually have to go much, much, much further back which is um, New York on the 30th of September in 1962. Uh, you may recognise this man, it's uh, Jonas Mikas, and he's standing outside of um, anthology film archives and the, the cinema space as well. Um, and uh, he was uh, instrumental in, in the formation of the New York Filmmakers Co-op. And I think it's kind of worth, or I, I find it, worth going back to these original principles. It's really where Lock Scotland does come from in a, in a kind of uh, origin sense. Um, to kind of go back to uh, the, the kind of the, the original mission statement uh, that, they've, that they put together. And a lot of these things, although they're kind of a little bit kind of polemical and antiquated, or they, they seem kind of quote unquote cute, no, um, actually are um, still very much at the heart of what um, we would like to achieve at Lux Scotland um, because it's about addressing um, an absence of structure and an absence of um, a, a formalised network um, and trying to kind of develop something out of what is in pockets but actually really kind of connecting things. And this mission statement is, is wonderful, I love it. Um, I'm just going to read little bits uh, from it because um, I've summarised it um, brutally here. Um, so number one, we believe that cinema is indivisibly a personal expression. We therefore reject the interference of producers, distributors and investors until our work is ready to be projected on the screen. Two, we reject censorship. We never signed any censorship laws, neither do we accept such relics as film licensing. No book, play or poem, no piece of music needs a licence from anyone. We will take legal action against licensing and censorship of our films, including that of the US Customs Bureau. Films have the right to travel from country to country, free of censors and the bureaucrat's scissors. The United States should take the lead in initiating the programme of free passage of films from country to country. Who are the censors? Who chooses them? And what are their qualifications? What's the legal basis for censorship? These are the questions which still need answers. And I think this is really interesting, not so much in terms of like a, a literal interpretation of censorship, but actually in terms of uh, kind of commercial pressures, commercial needs on artists, um, what gets picked up and actually what doesn't, and how, how does that relate to, to notions of quality and values and who's assigning them. 
uh, three is very important. Uh, we are seeking new forms of financing, working towards a reorganisation of film investing methods, setting up the basis for a free film industry. A number of discriminating investors have already placed money in Shadows, Pull My Daisy, The Sin of Jesus, Don Peyote, The Connection, Guns of the Trees. These investments have been made on a limited partnership basis. Um, so again, they're already kind of thinking about actually how do they structure their, the, the economy of their organisation in the long term and how do personal investors kind of come in on this. And this is what I'm trying to do now, in fact all the time. Um, they add, uh, the low budget is not a purely commercial consideration. It goes with our ethical and aesthetic beliefs, directly connected with the things we want to say and the way we want to say them. Um, I'm going to skip to the, 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 the last section, which is really, really great. Um, they say, uh, we're for an art, but not at the expense of life. We don't want false, polished, slick films. We prefer them rough, unpolished, but alive. We don't want rosy films. We want them the colour of blood. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's a little bit extravagant for Lux Scotland at this point in time, but you know, I'm not ruling it out. Um, but of course they uh, ended up with some really fantastic artists, uh, namely this man, uh, Jack Smith. And uh, actually um, the, the work of Jack Smith is um, owned by Lux, it's distributed by um, Lux and, and we distribute it in Scotland. Um, there had been very little showings of his work. Most students don't know who he is, um, art students, um, when I was kind of going around talking about Lux Scotland in uh, the various colleges and I was really terrified by this. So uh, we worked in collaboration, uh, one of our very first events actually was in collaboration with a commercial gallery, uh, the Modern Institute. Um, uh, the Modern Institute did an excellent exhibition. Um, of uh, his drawings, his photographs, his slideshows, and then we worked with them to present um, a, a screenings in an abandoned loft um, uh, in uh, Buchanan Street, right in the heart of the city, which is kind of now our office. So um, we're, we're um, embodying uh, Jack Smith in various ways. Um, so the New York Filmmakers Club is not some kind of uh, slightly facetious idea of like, oh, in the spirit of, it's actually very directly connected. Um, to where we come from. Um, the New York Filmmakers Co-op was uh, in very close connection with the London Filmmakers Co-op. There was very interesting movement between these organisations, uh, particularly artists who still exist in the Lux collection, like Vivian Dick, um, uh, who then lives in Ireland, Stephen Dwoskin, um, and uh, uh, younger artists at the time that were really influenced by this coast-to-coast um, -coast exchange, like uh, Stuart Marshall, um, and London Filmmakers Co-op started uh, with, obviously with an interest in celluloid and as technology increased we uh, began to move to video and then we have all these kind of very different names but underpinning all of these organisations was really um, uh, a question of identity politics, um, a question of uh, feminism uh, and uh, a lot of concerns uh, around um, who gets to be distributed, who's being selected. Um, and what's really, really interesting is um, how Lux in London has absorbed a lot of the works of these previous organisations and the New York Filmmakers Club um, uh, into its distribution collection. And so this, in, in a way, is what Lux Scotland has to play with in terms of a deep history of, of what we're able to show off our own backs. Um, I think it's really interesting as you kind of go through, you can see um, how funding from the Arts Council uh, in England uh, really, and the BFI, really affected uh, the, the, this nascent culture um, of, of distributors, uh, and specifically distributors who are interested in promoting the work of community activists, and that's really where it kind of starts intersecting with the political um, just to kind of pick out a few of the ones that are mentioned here, just to kind of give them a little bit more context. Um, uh, th this is a, an amazing project. Um, uh, both Circles and Cinema of Women were uh, dedicated feminist organisations um, and um, that kind of came together and it now exists as a, an organisation called Cine Nova. Um, that um, although we don't uh, distribute Cine Nova's licenses, we often broker relationships with them. We try to find points of intersection. And I'm really kind of keen on bringing Cine Nova up to Lux Scotland and continuing that close relationship. Um, 
But just to give you a little bit of background, Circles um, was uh, the first women's artist film and video distribution uh, organisation in Britain. And it emerged out of a really highly politicised context of the 1970s. Um, and I'm quoting a, a bit from Lucy Reynolds here, um, who, who is a former uh, Lux staff member and teaches the Lux and Res course at Central St Martins in London. Um, so she was saying um, uh, that it was founded in 1979 by a small group of filmmakers, including Felicity Sparrow, Liz Rhodes and Annabelle Nicholson, all of whom are in the Lux collection now. Uh, circles ran initially from Felicity Sparrow's flat, with women-only screenings and group discussions taking place at Four Corners Film Workshops in Bethnal Green. The group were concerned not only with the promotion of contemporary filmmakers, but also the rehabilitation of pioneering women filmmakers, such as Alice Guy and Maya Darren, who had often been overlooked in favour of their male contemporaries. Um, so this, this idea of both kind of moving forward in terms of uh, assessing what's on the ground in terms of contemporary practice and contextualising it in terms of, uh, I guess, lesser histories um, has really been at the heart um, of the Lux Scotland project and um, these are very much kind of touchstones, uh, personal touchstones for me. Um, and the other thing to kind of say about um, uh, the Lux collection that has begun to affect the, the um, the way in which Lux Scotland chooses to programme is, of course, uh, this period of uh, identity politics in the 80s and 90s. Um, we were, we uh, distribute all the works of Black Audio Film Collective, um, uh, which kind of came uh, about, and uh, also the works of John O'Comfra. So this is Black Audio Film Collective on the right, um, and then Seven Songs from Malcolm X, one of their productions, on the left, and we're now in the process of trying to persuade institutions to show their films around Scotland um, because there has been very little shown. I think uh, only one of their films has ever been shown in Scotland previously, uh, apart from the works that we've been doing in the past year. Um, and then of course there is the period of um, the 80s and 90s uh, which really shaped uh, a lot of the, the works in the Lux collection and continues to do so now. Um, specifically, uh, a lot of work around the rehabilitation of the work of Stuart Marshall, uh, who was a very uh, key member um, uh, of uh, London Video Arts, and um, he was a teacher, a writer, thinker, and an artist. Um, and uh, we're in the process of trying to uh, distribute quite a lot of his works in Scotland now, kind of on, almost as a, again, like thinking through models, like potential models that would be interesting to other people. Um, so that's just a little bit about where we're coming from, almost like the tools that we have at our disposal in terms of, or like the material that we have at our disposal as um, somebody who doesn't uh, necessarily have a collection, but has a collection to borrow from. Um, and I think that that's really important in asserting ourselves as actually an organisation with quite strong institutional uh, history, um, uh, despite our very, very diminutive size. Um, this was our first office. It was for free. Um, we got it from Glasgow City Council uh, in April of 2014, and we were given uh, £30,000 from Creative Scotland. Um, uh, and. We, ben and I had talked a long time about, oh, wouldn't it be great, wouldn't it be great, wouldn't it be great? And then it wasn't until there was a, a period of, I think, three or four weeks where Creative Scotland said, quickly, please apply for this money. Uh, we, we, we've seen your proposal and we want you to finesse it and apply for this strand. And then um, Glasgow City Council uh, coming to us and saying, oh, by the way, we have a free space. Do you, do you want to use it? So literally these two things kind of came and just popped us into being quite suddenly. And they, they had one member of staff for two days a week who sat in this massive room, um, uh, cold calling people, um, like literally saying, this is a new organisation, would you like to work with us? This is what we have to offer um, in terms of films that we would like to do, and maybe there's more in terms of uh, discussions, programming, education, uh, and learning. Uh, but I'm aware um, that April 2014 is a very specific time um, in uh, Scotland. Um, uh, I came back from New York uh, just prior to the vote on the referendum. It was like, one of the reasons that I came back. Um, not 
so much because of a particular political belief, but because I wanted to participate. It was um, a, a, a very interesting time, and still continues to be an interesting question uh, about whether or not Scotland should be independent um, from the rest of the UK. Um, but that had very direct ramifications for uh, thinking through uh, the, the urgency for Lux Scotland. Lux is funded by the Arts Council, um, it's, it receives core funding. Um, and uh, if we had become, uh, or if Scotland had become independent, the activities that Lux would be able to participate in north of the border would have been drastically cut. Um, it would have had to do with uh, international touring budgets, um, uh, not a core program. And so there was a real desire for us to start at least building this um, because it felt like it was a question that wasn't going to go away. But also to address um, the fact that Scotland has a very particular makeup, it has a very established film industry that doesn't necessarily intersect very much with artists moving image. And there's a real frustration that uh, a lot of really interesting artists that we work with often go elsewhere uh, to make their films, despite the fact that we have um, uh, uh, very established filmmakers coming to us and making work. Um, so there's differences, you know, not only in our cultural history but also in our cultural present, and the type of work that is made is really different. Um, I would say uh, it emerges from very different contexts and different practical questions um, from from those of uh, the rest of the UK or indeed metropolitan centres in general. I mean, this is just a kind of snapshot of from my favourite artist. Uh, so this is uh, Douglas Gordon's 24 Hour Psycho, which was uh, made for a tramway in, in Glasgow. Uh, the right is uh, Duncan Campbell's Turner Prize winning It For Others. Bottom left is Rosalind Nashashibi's Eyeballing. Uh, and bottom right is um, All Our Divided Cells by Luke Fowler. And um, while uh, Douglas Gordon and Rosalind Nashashibi are no longer in Scotland, the, the legacy of these types of works have had a profound influence on a lot of the students and the reasons why people still come uh, to, to, to work in Scotland. So we had a lot of kind of um, questions to ask, um, uh, namely um, trying to kind of assess the field in which we work. Glasgow is a huge and very vital hub for a lot of artists. It is one of the primary alternatives to London if you're an artist working in the UK, but it's very studio-based and it's very kind of DIY. Um, and that presents kind of certain questions for us uh, when you're dealing with a, a medium like a moving image, which is by, by its very nature networked and uh, by its nature collaborative. You need other people often uh, to make it. There are, there are, of course, exceptions to the rules to like people that make work on their computers, but... Um, uh, generally, in terms of uh, these larger productions, uh, having somebody to have a camera, having somebody do the lighting, having somebody help you with the grade or do the sound, these are things that people were doing off their own back, they were learning. And what we were interested in saying, no, actually, maybe people, um, uh, there's a baseline that we can kind of bring people up to or teach. Um, but also, there was a history to kind of be dealt with. You know, while I've talked about you know, Black Audio Film Collective, which is specific, I think, uh, to England in a way, um, uh, and um, the, the questions of ACT UP, which are specific to, to London and to New York, um, what were we really dealing with in terms of understanding contemporary art in relation to a uh, historical national context in Scotland? Um, and so we, we decided to, like, I guess, um, literally ask uh, the question, rather than, you know, as a national organisation, we didn't want to assume knowledge that we clearly didn't have. And I kept people saying we, it was me, <laughs> and um, uh, who hadn't lived in Scotland for a long time. And then uh, I ended up working with uh, my colleague Luke Collins. So at the point of this project called Where I Am, there was just two of us, and we couldn't um, answer the question, uh, what does a history of Scottish artist moving image look like. We had to work with a lot of different people. And, uh, you know, it's not even a question of saying, oh, um, well, we just need to go and ask them the right questions. It's like, who do we ask? And where are they? Um, so a lot of it's really kind of boots on the ground, um, getting out and trying to have conversations, like start conversations. 
the, there was no sector to necessarily to speak of. We had to invent the sector. Uh, there was uh, informal networks, but we weren't necessarily involved in them. So we had to find out where the doors were, what, which which were the right people, who who was going to help us. And so, um, you know, to go back to this this phrase that I used before, this kind of parasitic way of being. Um, we didn't want to just be in Glasgow. Um, it's it's a really kind of difficult thing to. Uh, push outside your metropolitan context, particularly when there's an audience and they're demanding that you show like Jack Smith and of course I'm like, yes, that would be great. But actually it's a question of trying to work a little bit um, uh, outside of at least the central belt of Scotland between Glasgow and Edinburgh um, and um, understand uh, where a lot of the history of Scottish Arts and Moving Image comes from, which is um, the Highlands and Islands. And so Where I Am was a project um, that was partly funded by um, uh, Film Hub Scotland, which is a subsidiary of the British Film Institute. Um, and it was to create uh, uh, programmes of work, screenings, in uh, non-metropolitan centres around the country. Um, but not to say what we were going to screen, but to ask what they wanted us to screen. And obviously that required a little bit of um, conversation as to what we had, what might be interesting. And this is a non-initiated art audience. Um, this is, uh, these are people who um, enjoy, you know, going to see an exhibition every now and then, but they're not necessarily makers. Some of them were makers uh, of Moving Image. Uh, some of them were just art appreciators and some of them were just interested in the books that we were circulating and PDFs that we were circulating. And so this took place um, in six venues. Uh, initially, it was in Sky, uh, North East, Orkney, uh, and a small part of Inverness Shire, um, Dundee, and in Edinburgh, and with really different organisations. Um, like one's a huge university institution, and then the other one. Uh, that was in Edinburgh, it was Talbot Rice Gallery. And then in Inverness Shire, it's, it's this place called the Highland Institute of Contemporary Art, which is essentially uh, the back of uh, two people's house that they run projects out of um, in the countryside. So there was a really kind of uh, large scale, but actually when you start to ask the question about what, what would you like to see, maybe we can show you like some clips, or if you tell us a little bit about uh, what your interest personally is, um, Maybe we can um, we can suggest some things, and um, so these working groups were formed in each of these areas, and um, they went through a huge amount of material together, and then presented a public program uh, over a period of uh, two or three months. Um, and this was great for us as well. I mean, you know, as a two-person organisation, um, we couldn't do it all. We didn't want to do it all, but it was actually about. Um, uh, inviting other people into that conversation and allowing them to do it and realising, well, maybe maybe that wasn't so hard or maybe I can do it again or what, what would I change? And then actually kind of setting up, you know, again, this terrible word, sector. Um, and some of these things are quite obvious in a way. Um, so in Orkney, um, uh, it's the, it was the home of, um, I, I guess, one of the most famous uh, artist moving image makers. Um, Margaret Tate, um, uh, who made a lot of her work uh, uh, on Orkney, um, although that she did have uh, films from Edinburgh and Glasgow. Um, but uh, one of the most well-known in terms of her experimental, hand-painted work um, and um, her work with sound. Um, and so we put uh, three contemporary artists in concert with Margaret Tate um, at the suggestion of the people, uh, the, the audience or the working group at Pure Art Centre on the island. Um, and then other things were much more unexpected. Um, in um, Skye and North US, they're very close together, these two islands in the Hebrides, they wanted to show Duncan Campbell's Lit for Others, which had just been shown at the Turner Prize in London. And um, I said, oh, well, that's, that's, that's great. And I really kind of think it really uh, displays like, my, my lack of knowledge more than anything else. But I said, it's quite, it's quite difficult work. Um, I mean, I, I find it difficult. <laughs> um, so maybe you could tell me like, what your engagement is about it. And um, uh, they, were, they said, 
oh well we want to talk about it in, in uh, relation to Albert Memmi's The Colonizer and the Colonized and relate it to the Highland immigration context and I was like that's amazing <laughs> yeah let's definitely do that so they set up a, a reading group um, to go through um, uh, I guess uh, texts that dealt with ideas of colonization and post-colonial uh, histories and really put this work um, into that frame and um, discussed, um, uh, I guess, discussed it in relation to uh, the Highland clearances, um, the, the, the forced removal of Scottish people off of English land in Scotland, um, and also uh, Im 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 uh, immigration uh, to the islands, uh, the introduction of different nationalities of people. Um, and so what they produced was uh, really incredible documents and uh, conversations around this work that, I, that you know, I, you, you can't really program those, you need people to come and request it. Um, so the, 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 the thing of where I am, like what does a, the, the, the key question of what does this history of Scottish artists and meaning image look like and can we voice that through contemporary work that we're producing in Scotland, of course has no answer. <laughs> Um, and while this was a project that lasted three months, I think that we're kind of at that point where we realise we probably have to do this as a bit of a bi biannual question. Uh, biannual because it took so much work, um, uh, just in terms of basic coordination and the, the time that it takes to properly sit down and engage with people, like not rush them through some kind of weird checklist um, for evaluation procedures. Um, but also because I think that this is the project that will allow us to get to the point of, um, uh, I guess, becoming a bit more ambitious with the way that we want to deal with um, learning or education um, and uh, the circulation and distribution of works that we don't have and we don't know about yet. Um, we need to be kind of told. But the, 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 the question that came up for us as an organisation after where I am was actually how do we formalise or how do we make ourselves more open and more porous to the people that we want to work with, you know, whether or not that's just somebody who, um, you know, runs the mooring licences off, of, uh, off of Sky who would like to, you know, possibly to see a Turner Prize winning work without going to London, um, or whether that's an artist um, who is looking to improve their skills in terms of 16mm uh, film processing. Um, and so what, while we, all of our events up until this point, unless that they were at a cinema where they take a charge for the box office, all of our events have been free. And that was really, really important to have that inclusivity. And I, I think that I would love it so that we didn't have to put a charge on anything. Um, but we did decide that, that there was a particular value in what we were doing and that there was a value in asking questions and making sure that the people that benefited from coming to our free events um, uh, tried to answer that in earnest. And so we applied for some funding um, to the Esme Fairbank Foundation in London um, uh, to set up what we, I think the, the way that we framed it was um, improving, uh, it was professional development. So how do we work with artists to improve the skills that they already have and how do you put them in concert with each other um, to, to kind of build a, a network or a community of, of makers. Um, and um, what that actual, the public output of that was a membership scheme uh, called Superlux. Um, it might not be very uh, apparent to um, members of Superlux and the people that are signing up, but that this is a professional development scheme, but it is. Um, uh, to them, this is the front-facing uh, benefits, uh, that um, we will do specific events with them, uh, that we have these very small bursaries, and when I say small, I mean like 400 pound bursaries, <laughs> um, for them to do research, maybe to attend a film festival, um, uh, that will open up our office to them, that they can come and view works from the collection. Um, and also, being quite ambitious sometimes with learning, we want to do like an online platform where people can uh, sign up uh, to a series of lectures, have uh, drip-fed content, so basically content that comes to them at their time and choosing, um, that doesn't require them to be in a physical location. Um, 
but that they would have contact with uh, a lecturer, um, that they would have contact with um, uh, other course participants to have conversations, to look at PDFs, to kind of really dig down into, um, I guess, more scholarly questions. Um, and so that's that's coming later this, this year. Um, so there's, there's kind of a, a host of reasons why it's good for people to join Superlux from their individual perspective, but for us, what that basically is, is it means it's an email, it's we're not interested in necessarily specific personal data so much as what is the age range of the people that we're engaging and why, why, what, what do they want from us, why are they with us and how did they find this and um, how can we serve them better and the desires for Superlux as a membership scheme is that there'll be um, uh, annual meetings where everybody kind of gets together and just literally sits down and tells us how we can work with them better because at the moment as a national organization it's, it's that thing of knowing that you have to demonstrate public need but public need and it is specific and it's changing all the time and um, when you're outputting program uh, and uh, uh, events at the rate that we do um, uh, there's not always time made for listening to this and I, I don't mean time made like a kind of evaluation form that you kind of try to encourage people to fill in at the end of the screening but actually kind of sitting down with the right people um, to say like okay so maybe you wouldn't raise your hand at an event and maybe you wouldn't talk to me at the end but if you if if we give you this will you tell us what you would like to see more of um, and so Superlux was launched at the end of December of last year and Kind of from from April 2014, we're kind of now in a really different place. Um, we doubled our funding from Creative Scotland. It was still not as much as we asked for. <laughs> uh, and we remained ambitious. We got extra funding from uh, Esme Fairburn uh, Foundation. We are moving in with uh, the uh, Centre of Contemporary Art, the CCA, in Glasgow. Um, no longer in a, in a kind of a, a non-institutional surrounding and uh, that there are more of us which is really amazing and um, so and it allows me to come to things like this and say what we're doing rather than just constantly doing it uh, in a room uh, on email so there's myself uh, there's the deputy director Luke Collins uh, we are working with a, a project administrator and administrative assistant and we also have um, internship schemes um, where they're supported through course credit or where we can find funding for them. So there's no free labour at Lux Scotland at all. Um, and so that's where we're at. I think the, the, the main questions for us, just to kind of, I guess, go back to the frame of this conference, is that we're now trying to assess some of the outcomes of, of the questions that we put in place and actually say, okay, so what should we collect? And I think that that's a really important question. I was really interested in, in the, the way that Wukachi were talking about um, uh, how uh, Filmoteca is almost like a kind of open uh, research project that is public. And I think that that's definitely something that we want to do um, to, to make this, um, uh, this whole question uh, in inclusive rather than exclusive. And to output a list of artist names, like say 100 artist names, you know, again as a provocation, but not say this is going to be the national collection that, that Lux Scotland gives you. It's actually this is who we think, but are, who are we missing and who do you completely disagree with? You know, there are urgencies uh, to certain works being collected. Um, uh, a, a very close friend of Lux, um, an artist uh, uh, who had been based in Glasgow for some time, Katie Dove, um, passed away. Um, uh, a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, and um, left behind a, a large body of moving image work that had she had been distributing herself. And so very quickly, um, you know, through uh, unexpected circumstances, you find yourself um, being uh, a mediator or having to push through urgencies um, on behalf of other people and try to kind of learn skills. While it's very nice to kind of sit down and pre-plan, um, actually what it comes down to is can this work be shown in this space at this time, and how do how do we do that? And I think that that's where a lot of Scotland's collection can really uh, can come in in quite a, a basic, practical way. And that's when we sit down and we say, okay, like the, all the concepts and definitions of distribution are really nice, but now this is what our plan is, and this is um, how we move forward. So 
that's a right rollicking ride through Luxe Scotland's two-year history, but 